In the ninja world, those who break the rules are scum. That's true. But those who abandon their friends are worse than scum. From the very beginning of the series, there was an extraordinarily faint idea of Kakashi's past, but from the impression given, it was not a pleasant one. During his time off, he would mourn by the village's memorial stone, and despite the passive-aggressive, assholy, practical, jokey, annoying actions he constantly took to have a fun time pissing off his students, in the entirety of the Naruto series, we did not see him laugh once. Of course, his backstory was revealed to be duly tragic many hundreds of episodes later, but until that point, we still see that sense of foreboding in Kakashi's weary eye. Eye in singular, because aside from the fact that the character design of his eye is different than every other character eye in the entire series, it's done very particularly to articulate a looming sadness. But even more fascinating is his other eye. Today we'll be decoding the tragic metaphor behind Kakashi's Sharingan, as well as the thematic philosophy of his entire character. Today I'm gonna put my hand on the table why I consider Kakashi's narrative to be the main focus of the entire Naruto franchise. And I hope maybe some of you will see Kakashi in a different light than you did until now. From the very beginning of the series, it was made perfectly clear that this Sharingan eyeball thingy is an addendum to his personage. He ain't Nuchiha, he can't turn it on or off, he has a scar around it, and even initially, his body can't stand the strain of using it for too long. Yet despite all this, he's world-renowned as Kakashi the Compi Ninja, Kakashi of the Sharingan, a master of a thousand jutsu copied due to the power of his Sharingan. Even his own personal jutsu Raikiri, the lightning blade, can only be properly utilized in conjunction with his Sharingan. This results in an interesting situation. Kakashi, as we know, is a total beast even without the ultimate eyeball. He was a Chunin at 6, Jonin at 10, and Ambu at 13. These are some pretty legendary stats. In fact, it's the best in the series to our knowledge. It took Itachi until 10 to become a Chunin, and <laughs> we know how badass that guy is. Yet despite how insanely skilled Kakashi was, by his own right, it's his Sharingan that really gave him access to the ranks of the untold power of the Bingo Book of Legend. Yeah, I watched the dub. <laughs> the bingo book. Kakashi's Sharingan was clearly not part of himself, but outwardly seemed to be a vital aspect of his being. Due to slight daddy issues, Kakashi was a loner as a kid, and despite being surrounded by Rin, Gai, and Obito, he forced himself away from them to do everything himself. So the first time he welcomed Obito into his heart, when they were finally working together as best friends for a common, vital goal, Kakashi went through the mental trauma of believing he caused Obito's death. And that's when Kakashi of the Sharingan was born. That enveloped his identity and became a constant metaphor for the emotional upheaval of his life. The Sharingan itself represented the emotional weight of Obito's loss that he carries with him every day and that he's constantly reminded of. And of course, the Mangekyo Sharingan, which he acquired through the loss of Rin, acts as a constant reminder of that little bit of tragic past. He constantly bears the grievances of these two losses with him on a physical level because he literally has that red thing lodged in his face, but also metaphorically, it's a burden to his past of his two best friends. The three major recurring themes from his past that will continue rearing their ugly heads throughout his life are completely reliant on the three characters he once loved. First was his father, the White Fang of the Leaf, someone who he initially loved but in the end felt betrayed by. But that trauma left Kakashi even as a child, as a morally disingenuous stoic. The second was Obito, a character that he initially vehemently disliked, but within his last moments became Kakashi's best friend. The initial distaste was sparked by his father's betrayal, air quotes, because his father did the right thing and the honorable thing, but being all moral and preachy didn't really help him out. So Obito fighting for light-hearted, simple-minded, honorable goals was the bane to Kakashi's new formed ideology. That's where the rift between them started, and the third major theme was Rin. He liked Rin and was liked by Rin, but was not only unable to protect, but instrumental in her death. His powerful lightning jutsu would represent his father's legacy, his Sharingan would represent his self-doubting past, and Obito and his Mangekyo represents his pain and loss in Rin. These three recurring themes are constantly showing up in his life if you'd looked just slightly past the superficial. And it's this little detail that kept Kakashi as consistently in my top three Naruto characters. So now's when I outline bits and pieces of his life in a possibly slightly different light than he may have been seen before. And inevitably, time to get taken over by feels. <sighs> 
Kakashi became renowned via using his friend's Sharingan, constantly bearing that weight even though whenever he would use the Sharingan for too long, or the Mangekyo Sharingan, it would leave him bedridden. Delving too far into the burdens he still carried from the friends he lost, Obito the friend he lost and mourns to this very day, ended up resurfacing in the series as the main-ish villain, pulling all the strings in the entirety of the story up till the war arc. Kakashi's failure to save his friend resulted in not only his friend's death, but Kakashi had to witness his death twice, each time done to save Kakashi himself. But before his second death, Kakashi had to watch his pure-hearted friend completely driven mad and seek the destruction of the entire ninja world. That same world that Obito died protecting twice. What really makes the reoccurrence of evil Obito so incredible from Kakashi's perspective was because the other major trauma in his past was how he failed to protect Rin, taking her life with his own hand, no matter the circumstances. But he sees the brutal extent to how badly he failed because he failed Obito as well. Yes, in the series proper, it was infuriating that Obito decided to drop some nukes on the universe because the universe killed his girl, but in Kakashi's character writing, it was spectacular. His meeting Obito in the war arc as a relatively evil dude tore open the wounds of two of his greatest losses, obviously Obito's, but even more powerful in Rin. I've had this idea in the back of my mind for a long time. Superficially, the war arc, especially the Kaguya climax, was a bit of a disaster. I poke fun at it in my Honest Description series for like 30 minutes straight at its multiple plot holes and inconsistencies. And well, so do most YouTubers, even Swag Kage, my personal favorite Narutuber and bona fide Uchiha Tard extraordinaire, made videos on how to fix the war arc, making fun of the war arc. I will linkify them in the description. And the points he made in both of those videos were not only just valid, but they were prudent. We can all make fun of Kishimoto's bad superficial writing decisions, all we like, but it's clear to me at least that the ending he was gunning for all along was the soul of what took place. Don't get me wrong, I'm not coming to say, I forgive you fam for superficially screwing up the entire ending cause <laughs> soul. I believe he wrote himself into a situation where he needed to perform the various ass pulls to retain this soul he was searching for. And the reason why I'm mentioning this here in Kakashi's video is because even though Naruto is obviously the main character of the series, being that <laughs> you know, it's kind of named after him. Kakashi's thematically the most developed and explored character through the ending climax. So while I may do a in defense of the Naruto climax video, today will be Kakashi focused. <laughs> the way I like it. And there's two specific aspects of the Kaguya fight that served as a beautiful ending arc for Kakashi's story. Even after Obito's death, I guess we as viewers never anticipated it to hold any emotional weight, which it did, but he used this dimensional distorting Kamui to literally warp his shotting gun from the dimension of the dead to the dimension of the living. As I've mentioned, superficially it made no sense. The soul was there and, and I'll, I'll try, man, guys, please. All these years of Kakashi's fighting using Obito's Sharingan, it served the purpose as a remembrance of his old friend. He used it to help his nation, but he carried the pain it reminded him of along with him for his whole life. Now it's time to use that pain and to accept your past, because Obito was rooting for him, even past his own death. So Kakashi, using the Sharingan at full power, isn't as an heirloom of his friends that sits on his chest as a burden, but at this point at least it's a full-blown entrusted legacy that was given to him to exact vengeance and to save the world. But even more so, it was for Obito's ultimate repentance. This wasn't some plain old Sharingan, mind you. It came along with the Mangekyo as well, and a pretty perfect one at that. As I've mentioned earlier, the Mangekyo represents the loss of Rin. Now, losing Rin served two interesting purposes in Kakashi's life in regard to Obito. Firstly, it was the breaking point of Obito. Rin dies, Obito goes nuts, destroys the planet. Makes sense. But secondly, in Kakashi, it was him failing to protect the Rin that he promised the dying Obito that he would protect. So with Obito literally giving over his everything to Kakashi, it came along with his longest dormant and finally emergent will of fire to do what's right and forgiveness for Rin's death, solving both of these Obito issues. Rin's death would no longer be shackles to Kakashi's life because the past happens. There's no use running away from it because there's no use trying to change it and there's no use trying to suppress it. Obito giving Kakashi the full power Sharingan wasn't to help him run away, change, or suppress the past. It was the ultimate push forward from the past to move forward, and move forward he does. By the end of the fight, Kakashi is finally comfortable with himself for the first time in his whole life since his father's death. His Sharingan is gone with the burdens of the past 
past it carried, finally being left to rest. And Kakashi in the future still becomes one of the most legendary ninja alive. He becomes a Hokage of extraordinary might, and he's no longer famous as Kakashi the copy ninja. And he's no longer famous for his Sharingan. He's a total badass and moral ninja from the third recurring theme of his past, White Fang of the Leaf, where a wise morality would trump honor, and where Kakashi is known as a total beast from his own lightning-style jutsu. But as I've mentioned, Kakashi's shining on in past was only one major theme of Kakashi's narrative, finally aligned during the Kaguya climax, but there was one other as well, because the whole beauty of the shining on metaphor throughout the series that's finally wrapped up here is basically telling you, start looking forward, fam. The future matters too. So let's talk about what Team 7 truly means to Kakashi. Kakashi has not accepted students until Team 7 arrived because each team he'd assess was lacking teamwork. This isn't said, but clearly alluded to. And there's another reason why he grew extraordinary close to Team 10 as well. Naruto was the number one knucklehead ninja of his generation. He wanted to become Okage, and he wallowed in his childish mentality despite having such straight-laced morals at a young age. All those attributes I've just described in Naruto is exactly what made him a bit annoying, I'll give you that, but they're also the exact identical focal attributes Obito possessed in his childhood. And I'll get back to Naruto in a moment, but if you look at Sasuke, the kid with the sad past of his family dying, and in his eyes, he was betrayed by his greatest role model, who brought disgrace to his entire clan as he wiped it out. Because of this past, Sasuke only had the mindset to grow stronger, and he was arrogant to the point that he looked down at his childish contemporaries. These attributes of his, despite yeah being slightly annoying, I'll give you that, are the exact identical focal attributes to Kakashi as a kid as well. And then, of course, the Naruto Sasuke Sakura love triangle thingy is a basic mimic of the Kakashi Obito Rin one, where Sasuke was. Kakashi, Naruto is Obito, and of course Sakura is Jiren, because uh, both medical, both in the same love triangle thingy, and both useless. I feel like I just ruined a good moment there. Anyway, the point is, there are these three superficial seeming differences dividing Sasuke's situation to Kakashi's, despite their basic philosophies resonating with each other perfectly. The first is Sasuke had a focal point for his anger being Itachi, while for Kakashi, his father was already gone. So while he had something to focus on to exact revenge, that focal point was not getting any closer, with Itachi still insanely easily overpowering him in the Tsunade arc, making Sasuke's steady growth in strength seeming pointless. The second was the welcoming hand of Orochimaru, which was not tempting Kakashi, and the third was Kakashi witnessed Obito's demise and he felt responsibility, causing him to reconcile from his arrogant stoicism, while for Sasuke, he saw Naruto surpass him in many ways ways, which only was fuel to the fire of helplessness. These are situational differences that were due to life experiences. That's what made their individual past so extremely dissimilar. If not for that, they're one and the same. And Kakashi saw that very well. Kakashi taking Sasuke for private training between the second and third rounds of the tuning exams were, yes, pretty terrible sensei ship to Naruto, but where in Kakashi's mind, it was pivotal to Sasuke. Kakashi assumed Lightning Blade was the only solution to Gaara's invincibility, and Sasuke needed to win desperately but he did not get that win. Not only did he lose, he got to see Naruto take that victory. Another situational difference between Sasuke and Kakashi that Kakashi saw coming, tried everything to avoid, and still failed miserably. Team 7 was Kakashi's past thrust into a different situation, and Kakashi would get it right this time. But Kakashi didn't get it right this time. Sasuke, due to these experiences, deserted to seek counsel by Orochimaru, and Kakashi lost resolve in training Team 7. Kakashi once again saw his family crumble, Naruto getting adopted by Jiraiya, Sakura receiving training by Tsunade, but this is why I call Kakashi's narrative the focal point of the Naruto series. The Kaguya Climax was for him. Throughout the greater narrative, Kakashi's soul was at two points of time at the same time. It was living in the past, carrying his past with him wherever he went, with the burden of the Sharingan and Mangekyo in every action of his life, constantly grieving and going to the village memorial stone. And the second half of his soul was in the present, reliving these same attributes that made him who he is vicariously through the lives of Team 7. But this time, the outcome was unforeseeably different. It wasn't Obito and Rin that didn't make it, represented by Naruto and Sakura, but it was the Kakashi of the generation. It was Sasuke who didn't make it. And it was clear to Kakashi that he only is who he is today because of the losses he's suffered and the experiences he's experienced. For a lot of people, one of the high points in Shippuden was when Naruto first met Sasuke since the time skip. It was cool and all, but I vehemently am putting my foot down that Kakashi meeting Sasuke at the Five Kage Summit was far more powerful of a moment. 
Kakashi saw himself inside Sasuke, but a version that went terribly awry. But again, he felt responsible for another loss. As the sensei figure, he was responsible for something becoming a monster, and it was completely at this point out of his hands to rectify. Both halves of his soul that were brutally battered into tatters were simultaneously regenerated in the Kaguya fight. Obito completely gave Kakashi a perfect closure by giving him a perfect ass pull Susano, saying, the past cannot be changed, but the future can, as I've mentioned. So with his sights set forward, Team 7, which played the role as his precious students, as well as his vicariously living family, did the impossible and came together for the first time fully respecting one another and overcoming the greatest evil known to the ninja world. Neither Team Minato nor Team Kakashi ever successfully managed this in the past. There's never a single point in time for the squad of Obito, Rin, and Kakashi or Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke that they ever fully work together trusting each other. And from this point on in the series, even in Boruto, Kakashi's eyes are not drooped with a stoic sadness, but they're vigilant with a prideful contentment. We now close the book on Kakashi's past, multi-generational, somber, thematic narrative, and we can crown him as a successful Okage, no longer bearing the metaphoric burdens of the Sharingan, but be badass nonetheless, finally accepting the hero White Fang's legacy as a moral leader, and a master of non-Kekai Genkai, basic but powerful lightning-style jutsu. Kakashi, only after all this time, can finally have the future. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed. I'm personally really happy with how this video came out, and I would love to hear in the comments what your thoughts on it also because it took a lot of time to put together and honestly i'm curious to hear if your opinion of kakashi has changed even a little slightly feel free to leave a like if you did like and feel free to subscribe if you want more weird enough to focus on extremely deep philosophical analyses and super lighthearted satire stuff so if you like any of that you're more than welcome to join the ranks of the fan base also notification bell to subscribe because they should really take the word subscribe from the red button, just stick it into that notification bell, since that's the only thing that really <laughs> does anything these days. If you want to help support the channel, which would be extremely appreciated, feel free to follow me on Twitter, link in the description, right next to merch, which also, again, aside from looking badass, also really helps the channel, and my Patreon. Anyone who becomes a patron is invited to the private Discord server for patrons and me, which is awesome, I guess. And also, huge thanks to the patrons that are already supporting me. The six Swag Coggers, MD, JD Fincher, Q, Zindergarten, Axel, and an anonymous member. The three Lord Tweegers, Tyler Schumacher, Gavin Anderson, and Large Blab. And the three God Usopp Rank, Zachary Wheatley, Dark Element, and Ezedric. I hugely appreciate all of your donations and really all of your time spent watching my videos. So with that, I bid you adieu. Have yourself a most wonderful evening and remember to stay weird, fam. In the ninja world, those who break the rules are scum. That's true. But those who abandon their friends are worse than scum.